You look old. Why do you look so old? That's what we do. We look at someone's face, we make a judgment on their age, and we call it a day, even just subconsciously. Maybe not like Anna Delvey, but we are doing it in a way where we just understand this. But it's not quite as simple as how someone looks. There are specific things, hallmarks of aging that are going on within our body. And there was a study that was published in the journal Cell that really highlighted this. They pretty much said there's about nine hallmarks of aging that need to be looked at when you look at all the different things, okay? We used to think that oxidative stress was one of the main drivers of aging. It probably still plays a role to a degree, but it's certainly not the only thing like we used to think, right? So I want to focus on these nine quote unquote hallmarks of aging that we can probably expect to change again in the next decade. But for now, we want to look at those and also simple things that you can do to correct or mitigate some of the damage of these nine hallmarks of aging. Now, there's some I'm going to focus on more than others, and that's just based upon my areas of expertise being fully candid with you. But let's go ahead and let's dive in because understanding the hallmarks of aging is very important. The first one is actually mitochondrial dysfunction. Now, this is actually a hallmark of aging. Mitochondrial dysfunction is when your mitochondria, your energy powerhouse in the cell, is no longer able to convert fuel as efficiently into energy. It's not able to take your energy from what you eat and turn it into adenosine triphosphate and create energy. The mitochondria is where all this happens. And as we get older, our mitochondria just don't function as well. Okay, so we need to put extra emphasis on what is called mitochondrial biogenesis. Mitochondrial biogenesis is where the mitochondria essentially go through what's called mitophagy. So mitophagy is where mitochondria that are old and decrepit and don't really provide us much use anymore, real garbage mitochondria, are disposed of and broken down and you have an increase in the number of strong mitochondria. So more mitochondrial density. So basically you can have more overall energy with less mitochondria. It's a survival of the fittest thing. So it's called mitochondrial biogenesis where you're giving birth to new mitochondria. Now this sounds like something that Thomas DeLauro would typically talk about in his videos. And I'm not just saying this to toot my own horn. This is literally one of the nine hallmarks of aging is mitochondrial dysfunction. So quickly, how can you improve mitochondrial biogenesis? A couple of quick ways. Exercise, okay, especially in that zone two, zone three cardio. That's gonna be like your 50 to 65% of your maximum heart rate. Any kind of endurance work for like 30 to 60 minutes, two to three times per week is tremendous for mitophagy, okay? The occasional fasting, the occasional lower carb diet, yes, that as well, but I really wanna focus on the exercise for the mitochondrial biogenesis. Uh, there's also something called urolithin A, which is in pomegranates, believe it or not. Pomegranates contain, well, it's kind of a long story, but basically when you consume a pomegranate, you have what is called a postbiotic effect where the bacteria within your gut react with the polyphenols in pomegranate to form something called urolithin A. So the occasional bit of pomegranate juice might actually be very good specifically for mitophagy. I'm not saying it's going to defy aging or anything like that. It's just little things that you can improve. Now, of course, we could go down the rabbit hole and get a lot more granular, but we've got a lot to cover. So let's move into the next one. The next one is called cellular senescence. Now, cellular senescence is where the cells essentially stop dividing. Okay, it's sort of uh, an arrest of the division of cells. Now, what that means is that they just are slowing down. Normally, like, when you are a little bitty baby, you've got like cell division going on like crazy. And as you get older, it starts to just slow down. Now, I wish that I had a magic fix for cell senescence. I don't. One of the things that we can talk about is like, there is probably a link between mitochondrial uh, dysfunction and cellular senescence as well, right? So like when the mitochondria is not functioning as well, when energy manufacturing is defective, then cellular senescence would probably be different as well. So unfortunately I can't spend a lot of time on that one, but it's probably an indirect effect of some of the metabolic changes that occur, which we'll cover in more detail. Now the other piece is stem cell exhaustion. Okay, now with stem cell exhaustion, some of this can be measured through what's called DNA methylation. Not to get super complicated with you, but uh, there is something called the epigenetic clock. Okay, the epigenetic clock looks 
at DNA methylation to ultimately give you what's called a biological age. It gives you uh, how old you are at a cellular level versus a chronological level. And the reason that DNA methylation plays a role in stem cells is because the more that genes are silenced by DNA methylation, the less stem cells are ultimately produced. Now, there's some interesting data with fasting and stem cells. Now, again, I can't speak out of turn here because the data is a little bit inconclusive, but essentially when you are fasting, it can stimulate more stem cell production in specific areas of the body. So I don't wanna make this like a self-fulfilling thing where I'm just circumnavigating all the way back to the things I talk about the most, but caloric restriction, fasting, the occasional prolonged fast, and when it comes down to stem cells, most of the data for fasting is with longer fasting. The shorter term fasting is tremendous for metabolic effect. The longer term, and I mean like 36, 48 hour fasts, like once every six weeks, maybe do a 36 or 48 hour fast, something like that. Those are much better in the stem cell category. Again, I'm not an expert there. Yeah, I'm much more an expert in the insulin world and much more of an expert there, but it's still important to note, like if you can make these little changes in everything for all nine hallmarks of aging, it's pretty powerful. Now the next one is deregulated nutrient sensing. Interesting, because nutrient sensing is exactly the things I talk about. Okay, basically the cell's ability to recognize that there is glucose, or the cell's ability to recognize that there is fat. Right? It's understanding an insulin sensitivity model, understanding that whole process. So when you have impaired nutrient sensing and it's completely dysregulated, that is a hallmark of aging. Now it can definitely have a link with mitochondrial dysfunction, right? Because as a cell isn't able to recognize that there's fuel, it can become insulin resistant. And when that happens, then you have mitochondrial dysfunction that can happen downstream from that, right? So if a cell can't recognize that there is fuel, it continues to get more insulin resistant. You end up with more high levels of fasting glucose, more uh, increase in HOMA IR. You have all these fasting insulin increases, potentially, like all these different problems. And when you start looking at the data with type two diabetes and all of this, you see insulin resistance tends to increase as we age. Which came first, the chicken or the egg here, right? So some of the solutions with this, okay, the first one, because not everyone likes to fast or not everyone likes to go low carb, is add more fiber into the diet. It is really simple. Okay, fiber plays a huge role because specific prebiotic fibers can help what are called butyrate producing bacteria. Okay, so if you feed your gut with diverse fibers, chia, flax, psyllium, things like that, sacha inchi seeds, these things that are easy to get, what this can do is it can feed the bacteria in your gut that thereby produce what are called short chain fatty acids. These short chain fatty acids, believe it or not, influence how our cells see glucose. They can actually affect glucose modulation and they can even affect fatty acid oxidation. So what happens downstream of us digesting fiber is nothing short of remarkable as far as what it does at a cellular signaling level and what it does for nutrient sensing. I tell people all the time, if you can't go low carb, if you can't fast, if it's difficult for you, increase fiber. If you look at the blue zones, what is one thing they have in common? They all consume a lot of fiber. Okay, and I'm not someone that's like a zealot saying, eat just a ton of veggies and do this. I'm just a realist, okay? I like meat as much as the next guy, right? But I do think that fiber is very, very key here. I did put a link down below for seed if you wanna try them out, okay? So seed has two cool things. I talk about their symbiotic, which is for adults, right? It's a capsule inside of a capsule technology. You can see the footage, super cool. But now they have something called PDS-08 which is actually for younger kids as well, for ages three to 17. So if you're watching this video, you're concerned with your age, and maybe you're concerned with your age because you have kids, right? That's what happened to me. Like, I didn't think about longevity topics that much until I had kids, and I started paying attention to that. So the PDS-08 is in a simple packet, and it's a two-in-one formula that has prebiotics and probiotics with nine heavily researched strains, but get this, they did their own clinical study. Okay, C did their own clinical study in pediatric populations. 
Now, I know I sound stoked about that, but that's because there's no one's doing that. No one is actually doing pediatric like probiotic studies in an actual pediatric population. They found no adverse effects, so no bloating, no GI distress, and they found improvements in their poop, they found improvements in the quality, smoother, more regular, and just overall better gut health. So very cool thing. So I put a link down below so you can save 15% off either one, either the adult probiotic or the kids PDS08. Honestly, I take it too, because. I had my food poisoning a little back or a stomach bug or something. So I went ahead and I added some of the kids probiotics. I didn't want the full effect and I felt like it restored things really quick for me. So pretty cool. So that link is down below in the description. The okay, other things that you can do really quick for the nutrient sensing piece, minimum of 12 hour fasts. Even if you don't fast, just fast for 12 hours each day. Okay, it's, it's pretty easy. Don't stop eating at 7 a.m. Don't eat until 7 p.m. Just that alone has very close effects to a 14 hour fast. And guess what? A 14 hour fast has very similar effects to a 16 hour fast. So the difference between a 12 hour and a 16 hour is so negligible, even though other benefits come in at 16, which I know, but if you can't do that, just 12 hours, that's it. And then if you can't do that, just try cutting out carbs just with breakfast. Any break that you can give your cells from the constant bombardment of glucose is awesome. The next one is altered intercellular communication. Now, this is another hallmark of aging because the ability for cells to communicate with one another is so unbelievably important, okay? Now, in this category includes inflammation, okay? Inflammation will dysregulate cellular communication. Think of it like static, okay? If you've got static, it's hard to hear someone's message, right? If I called you on the phone and it was super staticky, you wouldn't hear my message. It is almost, almost literally that way in the cells, right? If they're trying to communicate with one another and they're static because there's so much inflammation, it's hard to get a message across. So inflammation modulating pathways, like inflammation modulating techniques are a very important thing. Uh, fiber is another piece for that, right? Fiber is heavily linked to modulating inflammation. So we definitely want to be paying attention to that. Okay, sunlight very important for modulating inflammation. It's proving to be one of the most powerful things, right? Getting out and getting natural vitamin D that's synthesizing from the sun as far as inflammation modulation is concerned. Occasionally adding things like turmeric, curcumin into your diet. You don't need to be taking turmeric, curcumin supplements. You can take literally just turmeric powder and cook with it, but curcumin is going to be the more bioavailable form. Uh, ketogenic dieting, you don't have to do it forever, but if you wanted to do lower carb for a few weeks at a time, what this does, it can inhibit what is called the NLRP3 inflammasome. So as we get older, we have more of an inflammatory effect on uh, just our cells in general. Basically, the immune system is scavenging up and trying to fix all this cellular damage that happens with age. This causes what's called inflammaging, so aging-associated inflammation. Well, when you inhibit the NLRP3 inflammasome, basically you attenuate the immune system so it's not constantly overactive. One of the best ways that I know of from a nutritional standpoint is by doing the occasional low carb protocol. Okay, this could be very, very powerful for you. Another thing that you can do is drive up melatonin levels. Okay, so yes, supplemental melatonin may have a role here, okay, but that's speaking out of turn for me because the data is, isn't really concrete but melatonin plays a very key role as an antioxidant that can also help this damage associated molecular pattern scavenging that's occurring by the immune system. So taking a hot bath before bed to increase your melatonin levels or possibly blocking blue light in the evening time, anything you can do to jack up your melatonin levels. One of the best things that you can do though, get sun during the day. So by contrast, your body upregulates melatonin at night. The next one is called a loss of proteostasis. Now, this would be the inability for cells to fold and unfold properly, okay? It is called protein, uh, well, protein folding. So when this happens, basically cells form kind of cattywampus, and this is obviously a hallmark of aging per this journal cell study. So what are some things that we can do to help make sure that we don't have these misguided folding patterns with proteins? Two things, autophagy is a big one, okay? So once again, 16 hour, 18 hour, 20 hour fast a few times per week. Again, you don't have to do all of these things, but isolate them at different points in time, right? So this is very powerful because autophagy helps 
for the cellular recycling. So you get the proper guiding of proteins, but probably even more powerful than that is going to be two things, either taking a very hot bath so that you can simulate a sauna or go in an actual dry sauna. Okay, not an infrared sauna because those have different benefits, but a dry sauna at relatively high temperature for 20 to 30 minutes, two to three times per week. This is going to increase something called HSP72, heat shock proteins. These are literal chaperoning proteins. By a chaperoning protein, what that means is it's chaperoning those proteins to fold and unfold the way they should. It's like imagine these proteins being drunk and they don't know where to go and they're like trying to fold all messed up and whatnot and the chaperoning proteins are like their designated driver. They're kind of like, hey man, come on, let's go, let's go this way. Compile everything right, structure the proteins right, fold them right. A chaperoning protein makes sure that the proteins fold and unfold in the right place. Obviously, a hallmark of aging, something we need to focus on. The next one is one that I can't speak a whole lot about, but it's genomic instability. Okay, when you look at messenger RNA, when you look at messenger RNA being acted upon by a ribosome, by the ribosomes kind of communicate that into proteins, when this happens, when you have disruptions in the mRNA and the mRNA sequencing, this can affect aging. To this day, I don't know if there's specific things that we could do to correct that. There could be some theories that intermittent fasting, could be some theories that lower carb, could be some theories that like hormetic stressors like sauna, cold exposure could play a role with this, but it's tough to tell. So I can't speak out of turn on that one. So let's move on to the next one. Then there's telomere attrition. This is basically telomeres shortening. Telomeres are like the end caps on your shoelaces, right? So as these telomeres shorten, you have more risk of the DNA becoming exposed to things that will cause mutation and cause damage. So if you had shoelaces and the little plastic caps on the shoelaces frayed away, you'd, well, be left with frayed shoelaces altogether. They're holding things together. So we wanna make sure that we increase levels of what is called telomerase. These are the enzymes that can actually increase or stabilize telomeres from shortening, possibly even increase telomeres. There's some interesting evidence with different use cases and possible nutritional interventions there, but again, it's fairly bleak and it's hard to really speak to without speaking out of term. But with telomeres, one of the most promising bits of literature really looks at being able to be more resilient. So one of the things that we may wanna look at is proper implementation of oxidative stressors at the right time. Okay, so periodic cold exposure, taking an ice bath, taking cold showers, being exposed to cold temperatures. I mean, really shocking the body with things like that. So that you're strategically implementing oxidative stressors so that the body has more resilience and can upregulate what's called FOXO3 to provide you with more protection. Basically, if your body can upregulate its own antioxidant processes in the body, like SOD2, like superoxide dismutase, glutathione, you have more ability to protect from these oxidative stressors that may influence the DNA negatively as telomeres shorten. The next one is epigenetic alteration. Now this is the last one. This is when your epigenetics are like a locker room of genes, okay? And if you open one locker, you're expressing some genes. If you open 10 lockers, you're expressing 10 genes. Some lockers never get opened. So those genes you never, get exp you never express, right? Epigenetic alteration is when you have problems occurring within this, or genes are no longer getting expressed, or genes that shouldn't be expressed are getting expressed. One of the best ways I think that you could alter this would be through what's called histone deacetylase inhibition. This is just me talking based upon some relatively, well, solid, but not 100% something that we could chronicle and say is the, the only way. Uh, ketogenic dieting with the presence of ketones, possibly even exogenous ketones for this use case, are what is called a histone deacetylase inhibitor. This means it inhibits deacetylase, histone deacetylase. So it allows for a cell, or it allows for a gene rather, to become expressed that wouldn't ordinarily get expressed possibly, or it allows for more gene expression. It means you're able to tap into your genetics better. This is very interesting. Now, could there be adverse effects? Could you express genes that you don't want to express? That I don't know. And it could possibly have that effect. But if you're living the right lifestyle and you're implementing the things that I have been talking about along with histone deacetylase inhibition, 
My theory, my hypothesis would be that you would be expressing things that are advantageous for you because you're doing all the right things, triggering potential expression that would ordinarily be harder to express. So it's like you're doing all these things, but it's hard to gain the benefit from them. Being exposed to uh, ketones can actually potentially help this. So I'm not saying you need to do a keto diet. I'm very careful not to. I've crossed that road. I don't want to talk about that. But I do want to say that there is potential from a longevity perspective to have some beta-hydroxybutyrate circulating when it comes down to histone deacetylase inhibition and it's being looked at heavily in the research community in the world of aging. So I hope that this sums up the nine hallmarks of aging. I'm just a guy on the internet, but I can still speak to my experiences. So as always, keep it locked in here my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.